Good evening, and welcome to Speech Communication 4345, Crisis Communication. Tonight, we are going to be looking and continuing our examination of the personal loss unit that we started last week. I have with me our guest for this evening, Dr. Virgil Fry, who is a chaplain for the Churches of Christ at MD Anderson Hospital. Uh, Virgil's training was done in what is called clinical pastoral education, and that's the kind of training that most chaplains go through in order to be certified and trusted uh, to be turned loose on the premises of a hospital to take care of patients. And he'll be talking with you a little later on. But he's been at MD Anderson for just over 10 years now. I've known him for that length of time. He's been to uh, crisis classes in the past. This is his first television appearance. Uh, with this kind of class. Uh, he's done other things. But anyway, we're looking forward to uh, hearing what he has to share with us. We'll go back though, and well not really go back, but we're going to continue some of the theoretical perspectives that we started last week. I'm assuming by now that you've all read the textbook chapter, and if you have, then uh, you know that in that unit there is information from Kubler-Ross on uh, typical stages that people who are dying go through. Uh, there's also a Schneider model. So we're going to briskly go through that now. If you need to refer back to the book to get additional notes, then that's fine. The Kubler-Ross model says that people go through five stages. Denial and isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and then finally acceptance of the fact that they're dying. Uh, you know from your reading that you don't always, the person doesn't always progress nicely through those stages. There may be uh, phases of, of regression and overlapping and so forth. But it's not an unusual phenomenon to find people trying to bargain with God, to find people in stage one uh, who are denying that they're dying, uh, who believe that, that their stomach pain is... Uh, just due to something they ate, not to the fact that they're going to have surgery for cancer tomorrow, this sort of thing. So we want you to be aware of the Kubler-Ross model. Uh, it will be pertinent to some of our discussion later on. Okay, the Schneider model, you'll recall, said it's kind of an expansion of Kubler-Ross, a little variation on the theme. It says that initially there's an awareness of loss that we uh, make attempts at limiting our awareness by holding on or we may attempt uh, to limit our awareness by letting go. We, we may clutch onto things, hang on to uh, personal belongings, hold on to beliefs, or we may just get rid of everything in a hurry, sell all the stuff, give all the clothes away, and, and try to let go in a hurry. At some point in this progression, there is an awareness of the extent of the loss. You don't always realize that immediately, whether it's your pet, or your spouse, or your child, or your car that you totaled, uh, you know, the full impact of the loss may not hit you for a few hours, a few days. I remember the first dog that I lost, it was probably a week or two later that I sat down and really sobbed and realized that puppy wasn't coming back home. Okay, but eventually you gain some perspective on the loss, you realize that you know, for the things you lose, there are things you gain, there are opportunities. We viewed crises all semester as opportunities, tried to. And so you get some perspective. Uh, effort is made to resolve the loss, to reformulate the loss in a context of growth. And eventually, if things are going well, then the individual transforms that loss into a new level of attachment. Okay, let's think for a minute about some ways that people express their grief. And if we need to go back over these next week, uh, we will so that you can take more specific notes. I just want you to get the feel for this tonight so that we can move on into uh, our additional discussion. Forgot to check. Darren, are you out there tonight? No? Okay, we'll check and see if he comes in later. Uh, there are physical expressions of grief. If, if something has ever hit you really hard with, with deep impact, you may have that hollow feeling in the stomach, a tight feeling in the chest or throat, shortness of breath, muscular weakness, lack of energy, dry mouth. Uh, you may be overly sensitive to noise. Or you may feel depersonalized that nothing seems real. You're just kind of 
floating around and, and not even sure what's happening to you, kind of a quasi-shock phase. So for right now, just hold on to the notion that there are actual physical expressions of grief. Okay, there may be cognitive expressions, things in your head, disbelief, confusion. Uh, you may be pre a person who has died. Uh, you may become preoccupied with the dying process. Someone close to you has died, and, and now you just keep thinking about your own death and how that may occur. Uh, for some folks, there are encounters with the dead person, such as believing that they're still alive, thinking you see them uh, when they're not there. A tendency to go over and over all of the events that led up to the death. Uh, sometimes people will say, how can someone who was rallying on Monday uh, be doing, you know, be dead on Friday? And so uh, we may, Virgil and I may compare notes. Well, you know, I, I know she was upset about such and such. Yeah, well, this happened too. And so we, we replay this and try to work out all the details so that it makes sense. But the pieces, this bottom line says the pieces of information are integrated into a perspective that's understandable and reduces uncertainty. And, and so we're trying to make sense out of our world and the situation by looking at it that way. Okay, typical things you would expect is affective expressions of grief, emotional outlets, depression, sadness, sorrow. We've talked about some of those before. Relief, guilt, anger, denial. Uh, sometimes, if things aren't handled well, the support system's not all together, there may even be uh, later psychiatric problems that emerge. Mental illness, suicide, we spent a whole evening talking about suicide, uh, illegal behavior, a person becomes angry and starts bashing things or uh, takes drugs or, you know, different things can happen. But there are emotional or affective expressions of grief. There are behavioral expressions of grief, the, the person's behavior changes. It's not just the thought processes and the feelings. Sleep disturbances, either uh, insomnia or you sleep and you suddenly wake up with a start and uh, you're confused. Appetite disturbance, usually loss. That never happens to me, but uh, <laughs> I want to eat more. But uh, that's a common phenomenon. Absent-minded behavior. Some of us have that, and we're not emotionally disturbed. Okay, uh, social behavior may change. Dreams of the dead person are very common. Sighing a lot. And you, if you find someone in distress who just <sighs> sighs a lot, don't be surprised. Restless overactivity, not, just not quite knowing what to do with themselves. Crying. Uh, some people want to avoid any reminders of the deceased person and others want to visit places and carry objects and hold on to things that are reminders. So either one is a normal behavior. Treasuring objects that belong to the deceased and a kind of searching behavior, a restless preoccupation with thoughts of the dead person. Uh, and sometimes there's even a kind of perceptual desensitization so that other people start to look like the deceased person. You know, maybe in a grocery <coughs> store or the theater, or, or in the mall, or something, you'll, you'll think you saw the person, and it'll feel like that. But it's, it's just this searching uh, perceptual distortion that's taking place. OK, your book gives some advice for grief counselors, and we're going to use that as a transition uh, point here. And uh, we'll find out whether this chaplain does any of these things or not. Uh, avoiding excessive emotional investment in the client or the person. Uh, close bonds may cause bereavement overload. I know just from working as a volunteer for a few years that I got so attached and then my patients would die and then that was hard on me. A countertransference may awaken feelings of memories of your own losses. Uh, emotional replenishment is essential. Uh, there may be an existential anxiety about one's own death. This may occur, and it needs primary intervention. You need to know. I know part of the training you go through deals with uh, working through your own attitudes about death and so forth before you ever go in uh, to visit patients. Vicarious identification with others' losses may create a sense of power loss. You can, you, most of us have a built-in syndrome to try to fix things. 
and I think guys are probably as as much so into that as as women are. But uh, at least as a mom, I was expected to fix lots of things. And then when I started visiting people who were dying and I couldn't fix it, uh, that's a very frustrating thing. And so it's important to relinquish fantasies about saving or rescuing people who are in distress. So I don't know. Do you follow that advice? <laughs> How, right. do, how do you keep it I'll together that. here? Yeah. We're glad to have you with us tonight. Thank you for joining us. Perhaps they looked in the way I do things, and that's where they got this advice. <laughs> I think it's a constant struggle in finding a balance when we are caregivers, whether you're going as a professional or as a supportive friend or whatever role you're in. But these are things that we all get caught up in and we invest ourselves in, in a lot of things. Uh, as Dr. Hahn said, I am a chaplain at the MD Anderson Cancer Center and have been for the last uh, 10 years and have uh, learned quite a bit about uh, a lot of things that uh, become very important, a lot of things that people let go of, a lot of the things that were just mentioned as far as what we all go through when we lose something. The, uh, uh, there's a myriad of ways that we respond to losses. We're all unique individuals, uh, but there is some commonality and sometimes it's helpful to hear that somebody else has been through this and that there are some things that are not abnormal or that, that don't mean that I'm crazy because I'm responding the way that I am. Uh, it's also helpful if I'm going as a supportive friend or if you're going to, to be with somebody who's called you or to, who has gone through a crisis uh, that, that some of these things to allow them to happen is perhaps the best gift that you can give sometimes instead of, as you said, trying to fix it or talk them out of, out of the loss that's there. Uh, MD Anderson is uh, a place of uh, the biggest loss that's there, of course, is, is one's health because of what people are having to deal with, either they or their family members. Uh, it affects many thousands of people a year uh, in our state, and many choose to come uh, from all over the world to MD Anderson for the treatment that's offered there. And that may be an initial diagnosis, it may be for second opinion, it may be for things that might be considered uh, not frontline but experimental uh, uh, treatments, uh, and everything in between. And so uh, you run across almost any type of loss that would go along with health could be found in my line of work. And uh, sometimes in dealing with my own encounter with people and establishing a relationship with them, uh, I have to go back and remember some of this advice uh, that is given because knowing what I can be a part of, what I can be helpful with, what has touched me uh, deeper than perhaps a professional level but also uh, it, it triggers off things within me uh, when I visit perhaps a child who's close to my, uh, my children's age. I find myself particularly drawn to that patient and particularly interested and sometimes find it difficult to, uh, to pull back from what's going on with him someone who's my wife's age or my parents' age or my age, if I visit a male who's close to my age and dealing with something very difficult, uh, those bring about all kinds of issues with us and that's not wrong or bad uh, unless I'm not aware that that's going on and that's when I get caught up sometimes in, in not knowing where uh, the helpful boundaries sometimes lie. If you've had anything to do with hospitalization or doctor's offices or clinics, then maybe uh, you heard some statements. Uh, one time I wrote an article that I thought I would share with you. Uh, I entitled this, Statements You'd Rather Not Hear From Your Doctor or Nurse. Uh, maybe you've uh, encountered some of these. For example, if your doctor or nurse says to you, hmm, that's never happened before, uh, that's not <laughs> always considered good news. Uh, or this one, this may sting a little. My brother-in-law is a dentist, and I don't allow him to say that anymore because of what stings to him or, and to me may be very different. Uh, wouldn't you know it, that vein collapsed. It's not always considered uh, good news. Yeah. Uh, lab tech sometimes will hear that. Uh, if they walk in and say, we'd like to run a few more tests, most people don't consider that uh, good news. Or would you please lie down on this stainless steel table? I don't know why they have to be stainless steel and, and extremely cold, but they are. And uh, that's just, uh, fine. It just one of those things that uh, we have to deal with, I guess. When a doctor says, let me put some gloves on, that always <laughs> raises my anxiety just a little bit. Uh, 
you can change into this robe now. It's usually a sign there's something fun about to happen. Uh, if they tell you to cough, uh, that's uh, usually a command that uh, may or may not be welcome. If they ask you, do you have a will, it could be a <laughs> sign that uh, may be more going on than you want to be going on. Or if they say the office can work out a payment plan, <laughs> that's uh, one of those that gets hit a lot. Are you a religious person? Could be a sign that you uh, may be in trouble. The chaplain's on his way. Uh, I'll be back in a few minutes. I've uh, never found that to be a true statement. I don't know what a few minutes means to some people, but to me it seemed like a long time when you're sitting in a room all by yourself with just your thoughts. Waiting on the stainless steel That's table. That's right. <laughs> Uh, you need to sign a few papers first, is a, a statement that gets heard. Uh, we don't file insurance or Medicare. So uh, when you hear those kind of statements, you probably aren't the first, and uh, we sometimes have to use a little bit of laughter to deal with some of the anxiety that goes along. Uh, waiting, and waiting particularly if it's unknown, you don't know uh, what a doctor is going to tell you, is sometimes very anxiety producing. And uh, sometimes we bring a lot of that anxiety with us. Sometimes uh, we exaggerate what's going on. And sometimes we get broadsided with some news that's uh, very uh, devastating. Uh, there is a trust level that has to be established before you'll go see a medical person in, in the first place. That You are basically trusting uh, your body and uh, what belongs to you to somebody else to tell you how to deal with it. The types of, of loss that sometimes we deal with that uh, not just health but any kind are on the overhead at this point uh, that might be kind of helpful to look at some of the things that we go through just in normal living, not just uh, loss through death, that's the biggest, but some of the others that are there, for example, uh, the loss of, of belongings, things that, that belong to me. If you've ever had your house broken into or your car broken into or your purse snatched, um, Jacqueline had her whole house emptied. Then you know what it's like to, to grieve or to lose something. Uh, when that happens, sometimes we feel a little bit funny about being depressed or upset or thinking, well, it's just things, and we try to talk ourselves out of feeling badly. Uh, but there is a sense of being uh, violated. We have our space. We have the things that are important to us. And for you to take that from me uh, it creates a sense of loss. And there is a grieving process that goes with that. Uh, other types of loss, uh, accidents, things that are unexpected, uh, disease, limbs, uh, of course the death was mentioned earlier. Uh, loss of a relationship. Uh, you know, sometimes we downplay that, but somebody who's been very integral in your life, uh, a good friend, uh, perhaps a classmate or roommate, uh, spouse, anybody, uh, perhaps somebody leaves at work, uh, moving, if the next door neighbor moves and you've been very close, uh, any type of loss like that brings about a loss within us that we have to work through sometimes. And again, sometimes that's downplayed or people say, just get over it or that's just the way life is. But it really doesn't always explain away the hurt and the turmoil that, that I'm feeling inside. Uh, mentioned earlier was the loss of pets. Again, that one's often uh, laughed at or downplayed, but it can be a very significant loss if that pet is a big part of your life and your identity. What else do we have on there? Loss of job or money. Um, you know, financial losses are sometimes uh, some of the biggest, uh, not just because of the money, but because of the lack of power, uh, the lack of control. The loss of a job, I think, is extremely significant because often the way we identify ourselves with each other, uh, if, if I had just met Dr. Hahn within a matter of two or three minutes, what do you think one question might be that I would ask her? What do you do? Meaning, what kind of work are you in? Uh, who are you is really what I'm asking, but I'm saying, who are you based on what do you do? Uh, that's, that's one way that we identify each other. And so if I lose my job and you ask me what I do, then I may not know how to answer that in a way that will... Uh, I'm a couch <laughs> potato. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't always go across as well, and we don't like to say that. So, uh, Loss of success, a change uh, in what we consider to be a success, whatever that may be. 
uh, expectation, if you expect a raise, or you expect a job change, or you expect a new car, or you expect a child, or you expect a new house, whatever it is that you've invested some of your psychic energy into, if that doesn't come to fruition, that can be as big a loss sometimes as some of the other things that we've talked about. Uh, at that point, uh, we uh, then deal with the, the kinds of responses that, that come out. And one of the biggest ones that I think often doesn't get talked about in grief or loss uh, is anger. Uh, it is frustrating. It is, it is something that brings about a, a natural response of anger when we lose something. But we don't always feel comfortable uh, expressing that anger. And there may not always be ways or a support system that will allow us to be angry. Some of that may, be, may depend on how you were raised. Uh, if you were never allowed to, to express anger in any way as a child, then often that type of behavior we take with us uh, uh, as we are adults. And uh, we never allow anything uh, of anger to be expressed. Some people go just the opposite extremes. Anger is all that drives them. And, it, and they've got a real short fuse. And, and, and anything triggers it off. And so people tend to avoid being around them when they are that way. So probably somewhere between those two extremes are what we would consider normal, good, healthy reactions to anger uh, to our losses. Uh, it is normal. Uh, if it was important to you, if it was a significant person to you, if it was a significant event to you and you lost it, it hurts. And part of hurt includes anger. Uh, people often say that anger that's turned inward uh, becomes what? Depression. Uh, for many types of depression, not all, but many types of depression, if you really begin to look at it, if we're talking about normal everyday things, it's anger that's turned inward. If I don't feel like I can express it and, and I take it on myself and, and, and stuff it inside me, then it often comes out in, in depressive types of ways. And so there are ways that it perhaps is better to speak, it, speak about it, perhaps with a confidant, minister, social worker, professor. Uh, somebody who's trusted, a trusted friend, and uh, to me that's the key issue. Trust level is very important, and particularly if it's something that you don't want to, uh, to go any further. But without some, some way to identify that, for, for some of you it may mean go out and kick a football or uh, you know, to release it in, in some other way, then, then that will probably be more help than anything else than trying to deal with it or to deny that I'm angry. You know, a lot of times I'll tell myself, no, I'm not angry. Somebody will tell me that I'm angry, and I'll say, no, I'm not angry. Usually with a clenched fist, I'll say, I'm not angry. Uh, or the grimace on my face, or the tone of my voice. Uh, my kids may tell me I'm angry, and I'll deny it, but they're probably telling the truth because they know uh, what they're experiencing from me. Um, so identifying the target of your anger may be helpful, uh, and it can be a lot of different things. It can be yourself, disappointment in yourself. It can be God. Uh, it can be, uh, if it's a death, the deceased. It can be other people. It can be an event or all the things that we just talked about. And it will show up in body language and in your voice. And there are ways to appropriately uh, express it. Now, when we talk about uh, advice, and uh, particularly if we're trying to be helpful to people, Sometimes we have to recognize, if you're going as a supportive friend, uh, that there are ways in which may be more helpful than others. And it may be a little bit helpful to identify where's the loss coming from. Uh, for example, uh, an unexpected loss may carry a certain amount of weight with it that uh, a loss that has been more or less anticipated over a period of time may have. It, it still may be a significant loss. Uh, but Things that are considered instantaneous, that were not planned for. Uh, a shooting. Uh, the six people who were just killed in Corpus Christi today uh, on the news, uh, if you heard that. Um, uh, uh, that can be a community or a national crisis sometimes. Uh, the same can be true for a personal crisis. The doctor walks in and says, it's cancer, or it's your heart, or we're going to have to do something and we don't know where, where all this is leading, but it looks like we've got a very serious problem. Um, a failing grade that you weren't expecting. Whatever the, the loss, uh, that raised everybody's anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, that if it, if it catches you by surprise, then we often have to have some time 
to adjust to it. Personal experience. Uh, July 4th weekend, two years ago, two summers ago, uh, my son was 13 years old and had just gotten back from a trip that he had been uh, across the country uh, in the Carolinas uh, with a boys choir that he was traveling with. When he got back from that, he was doing fine and feeling well, but the weekend of July 4th, he kept complaining about diarrhea and, and his stomach cramping. Uh, he st still stayed active uh, until the Saturday, July the 3rd, and he's, he laid uh, in our living room all day, doubled up, and kept saying, I'm hurting, I'm hurting, uh, and I keep uh, having diarrhea, and I don't know what to do about it. Uh, being the good diagnostician that I am, I said, you'll be over it in 24 hours. It's flu, it's a bug virus, it, this happens, this too will pass. Just, just let it do that and you'll be okay. And that worked for a while as far as I was concerned. As far as he was concerned, it was not very good or helpful advice uh, because I really wasn't hearing the amount of pain that he was going through. To make a long story short, we wound up taking him to the emergency room in our local hospital that evening about 10 o'clock that night just to get him checked out and make sure he wasn't being dehydrated. We'd already talked to the doctor by phone that morning, but that night they said, go ahead and take him in and, and let's check him out. Uh, at that point, I discovered, uh, my wife and I discovered, that he didn't have just diarrhea, he had bloody diarrhea. And uh, he was just losing blood uh, in pretty good amounts, was getting pretty weak. And the, the cramping was not getting any better, it was getting worse. The doctor in the emergency room said, just to be safe, let's keep him 24 hours, get him stabilized, and I think you'll be able to take him home, but uh, let's, just to be safe, do that. So we agreed, and it took three hours to get him from the emergency room to a regular mm -hmm. room. It always does, which is a crisis in itself when you're wanting to, to get your child settled in. Or yourself. Yeah, <laughs> uh, both. And uh, so that finally uh, occurred, and... Uh, they began to give him pain medication and things to try to stop his diarrhea, but they still didn't know what, where it was coming from. Four days later, he's still in the hospital. They've run uh, colonoscopies. They've done everything that they can do. And uh, on Thursday after the Saturday, uh, his blood platelet counts started dropping. Uh, we thought he was stabilized. They thought it was uh, a colitis. But on that day, when the platelet count started dropping, they knew they weren't dealing with just colitis. And uh, I will never forget sitting uh, in, in my son's room with my wife beside me and uh, waiting for the uh, colon doctor to come in and, and tell us that this is what we're going to do. And he walked in and basically sat down and said, we've ordered an ambulance for your son to be transferred to Texas Children's Hospital. But when your mind is geared towards hearing, this is what we're going to do, to hearing a doctor say, you're already in a hospital, but we're transferring you to another by ambulance, uh, you could have knocked both of the parents over with feather. It, it got our attention very quickly. And I had been enough around people on chemotherapy and other things to know that a platelet drop was extremely serious. You don't let that continue without intervening in some way. Uh, at that point, they predicted what's going to happen is uh, his kidneys are going to shut down. He's going to have to have dialysis. If that happens, you're going to have to probably be in intensive care. So we went from uh, diarrhea to kidney dialysis in a matter of five days and not knowing if he was going to get through it. Basically what he had was uh, a, uh, the disease that uh, got some publicity with some of the hamburgers that were eaten on the west coast and in fact took some of their lives, uh, some of the, particularly with younger children. It was a disease called hemolytic uremic syndrome which is basically saying the kidneys are, are unable to function, they completely stopped up. So uh, instead of one night in the hospital, as the emergency room doctor uh, had planned, we spent three weeks in the hospital. And a week of that was in intensive care, several dialysis treatments, all kinds of shunts, and all kinds of things. Uh, but the final week, he began to turn the corner. He rallied. And uh, after several weeks of having him at home and checking his own blood pressure and all that stuff, uh, he was able to start school again. And uh, now he's uh, doing his good job of being an obnoxious teenager in our house. Uh, so there was a happy ending. We're very happy for that uh, obnoxious teenager being around. But there was a few days that nobody could say. Nobody knew. And uh, so I know what it's like to have something laid on you all of a sudden when you're not expecting it. And uh, you, just, you just stop functioning. Uh, you stop uh, living by the calendar. I carry a little 
pocket calendar and uh, that three weeks of things that I had scheduled and I had a lot uh, went by the wayside. The only time I looked at that calendar was who do I call to cancel today because you know I didn't leave and I had uh, permission from my uh, board that I work with to do that but I mean even if they would have asked me to work it wouldn't have done any good. My mind was not there until the crisis subsided. Uh, until you get through that then you can't really focus on anything else. So sometimes things come on us very quickly and sometimes you just pull up the resources you have and you uh, pull up the friends that you've got and you uh, pray a lot and you call on whatever resources that, that you think might be helpful uh, just to get through it. Do all of you know what a shunt is? Okay. Okay. Um, there is a, a sense in which the chart that, that's now up there that we'll refer to kind of plays off a little bit of the uh, advice to uh, grief counselors of, of kind of knowing the, the boundaries. This was developed by the MD Anderson Volunteer Department for the training that they do for volunteers. And it's just kind of a helpful play on words where they've taken two words that are used a lot. One is sympathy and the other is empathy. And saying there are two different ways to look at uh, how uh, care can be given. And they're basically using it this in, in this way in which sympathy is the less desirable and empathy is the more. Now there are other ways that sympathy is used in the English language. But in the sense of trying to take over and to fix something, that is the point that's trying to be made here. So if you take it in, in that realm and talk about sympathy as feeling responsible for others, being totally responsible for whatever it is that the person who's asking for help is, ask, is trying to do, then I try to fix it. I try to protect the person from what they're dealing with. Uh, rescue them from it, uh, control the situation or control their lives, to give advice, to carry their feelings for them, and don't really listen to hear them out. When I do that, and I do do that, I will confess to you that there are times I get caught up in that, then I often find myself worn out, tired, fearful, I feel sorry for the person, I'm anxious, and I feel responsible or liable for what happens to them. And uh, as a result, I'm more concerned with what's going on in their lives, with them getting it fixed so that they'll be free of that, uh, with giving them answers, bing, bing, bing. If you'll just do this, this, and this, then you'll have it fixed in your life. Uh, and try to manipulate them so that they will do it and fix it the way that I want them to fix it. Uh, the problem is there's not a whole lot of things that I can fix for Dr. Hahn or for you or sometimes even my family uh, unless you do it within the realm of what you're doing yourself. I have found it to be true over and over again. When I try to take somebody's life over for them and live it out for them and give them advice, then very often what I'm doing is trying to relieve my own anxiety. I'm trying to fix something that may or may not be fixable, but if you're trying to give me advice, maybe the biggest thing I need is for you to believe in me enough that I can fix it myself rather than you to try to take it over for me. And so that brings us to the other uh, word, which is empathy, which is if you're playing off those words, this is where instead of feeling responsible for other people, I may feel responsible to them. And I think there's a big difference in those words. There you do that by showing empathy, encouraging, sharing, comforting, understanding, uh, reflective listening. If I don't hear you out and really find out what's going on with you, I really don't have the tools to offer anything. Uh, advice wise and so uh, there is a, a belief to which I subscribe and a lot of helping people do that many times verbalizing articulating what's going on within you and seeking clarification of what's going on is very helpful um, sometimes the answer is within myself and I just can't see it crisis often puts blinders on us we don't see beyond the crisis uh, because it, it of the heat of the moment if I can have somebody to kind of move the blinders out a little way and say, you know, have you looked at it this way? Or is it possible that there is another way to look at it than the way you are? Then that gives me the chance to say whether I see that or not. Uh, that's different than saying, you don't feel that way, or you don't really mean that. Uh, those kind of statements tend to take away my choice in that. And therefore, an attitude would be a little bit different. When I feel a little bit more relaxed, you can tell me whatever, and I will, to the best of my ability, listen with non-judgmental uh, listening skills, if, if possible. It doesn't mean I don't have an opinion, and it doesn't mean I'm not going to respond, but it means I may not stop you in mid-sentence, that I may want to hear out the whole story before I respond. 
And therefore, then I have enough belief in you and in our relationship that maybe we can come up with some things that will be helpful. Uh, that, to me, is a much better way to deal with crisis than for you to try to fix mine for me. Okay, any response to that? Anybody ever have an experience where somebody has tried to take over your problem for you and live it out for you and tell you this is exactly what you need to do? Tell you how to fix it. Karen? What I'm experiencing more is as a parent of someone who's really kind of moving out, getting ready to move out of his teenage years, I have been in the, spent the last several years realizing that I needed to move much less in out of direct involvement and fixing and whatever, mm -hmm. and much more into simply faci facilitating and um, offering a springboard and a sounding board and, and not, you know, being the person who does it or, or even expresses how it's going to be done. Yeah. And that's hard to do. It is. Especially when you see things that perhaps they aren't seeing or you think they're not seeing. It's, it's like, can't you see that? But you're right. That's a good example. The parenting role, as the child changes and develops, then part of our job is to pull back, as was the job of our parents. And sometimes we do better at that than others. And the same is true of, of uh, friendship relationships as well, and sometimes employer-employee relationships and other things. Yes? No. I was just going to react on the exact opposite side of the role that Karen was talking about, being the child in the in the uh, situation, I was always told when I was growing up, um, this is what you're going to do, this is how you're going to do it, and I'm going to help you get through it. And then when I was on my own, um, it was harder for me. I felt almost handicapped in a way because I didn't know what, what to do, how to yeah. get things done. I had to learn it by myself. So it's not only the person having the sympathy that feels um, weak and overpowering and everything, but it's the person that's being and, and you need practice in making choices and living with the results of your own choices. Is that what right. I'm hearing but, you saying? Yeah, okay. but the hard part is learning that on your own and learning how to go through it. But if it started earlier in your life, whatever kind of cereal you picked at age three, that's what you ate. Whatever you chose for your lunch kit, that was it. Instead of mom always anticipating your needs and doing a good job of meeting them. Yeah, and often we do people a disservice, and this can be true in any kind of relationship, husband and wife, it can be true in adults uh, on any level, uh, and with children as well, where you, tr you take it over so much that you do not allow them to develop um, the confidence, allow them the, the risk of making a mistake and family. We often want to protect each other from making mistakes. Uh, that's sometimes good, but where do you learn the best? Within certain limits, some mistakes are inevitable, and what I would like to do is provide a, a safety net so that you're not going to do a mistake that's going to hurt you. Uh, I mean, my uh, son now, that's almost 16, uh, you put him behind a 4,000-pound car, and that changes the playing field a little bit because there are bigger stakes involved. Uh, but on the other hand, I can't always be in the car with him when he turns 16 and, and be looking over shoulder and driving. There comes a point at which he's got to do it himself. That's why my insurance goes up so high, because of that same <laughs> risk. Karen, were you going to come up? Well, in fact, I was just talking to my sister-in-law last night, who lives well out of state, so this should, she should never hear about this, because we were talking about um, one of her siblings, who um, some counselors and everything else have said, basically, relative to this other sibling, that you know she was kind of saying, well, you know, um, what are we going to do? How are we going to deal with this person? And they kind of said, look, you need to be prepared for the distinct possibility because of the really the injustice that her parents had done to this other sibling. They had they had always kind of allowed this person to kind of you know live with them. I mean, at, at like 49, she uh, up until the mother passed away, I think a couple of years ago, she had really never lived away from home, and and really never really had to pay rent or anything. Just you know, kind of got a free ride here, and and this counselor was kind of warning me. Such a said. Be prepared when, when you know the parents are gone. She may even end up trying to live at your house because it's almost like she's crippled. Yeah. She just doesn't have the confidence or the 
really the capability of, of you know, taking charge of her life and going forward with it. Yeah, that, when it goes to an extreme, it can, it can be a crippling thing. Now, if you put that in a hospital context of someone who's ill but with a serious illness, you've already got a control issue, don't you? Everything that I'm used to doing for myself, somebody else is now doing. Uh, you know, or the, the things that I eat, uh, the things that I wear, who can come in and out of my room. I mean, you wouldn't think of having your house or apartment in a way in which 25 people uh, in a morning could come in the front door without even knocking. But you pay people in a hospital to do that. I mean, that's kind of a strange way to look at it. But I mean, that, there, there is the right, particularly of medical people and visitors and others, to just come in your room at any time, any time of day or night, unless you specifically negotiate who can and cannot come in that room. Um, and so you're dealing with people that are already in a vulnerable position. And uh, if I come in and I'm a fix-it type of person and want to take over that room and fix your, your problem for you, I may not be able to fix your physical problems, but I'll just take over everything else. Fix I, my blinds, that's move right. my flowers. You know, if I walk in and immediately raise the blinds and say, it's too dark in here, you know, we need some light in here and cheer this place up. Or turn the thermostat down. It's awfully hot in here. Let me turn this down and cool it, cool it off. Again, whose needs am I meeting? Am I there for you? You may have been there all night with a fever, and that may be exactly why the room feels cold or hot to you. You may have not slept all night and needed the blinds closed because you're, you need to get your sleep, and that's exactly what the medical staff wants you to do, and I come in and try to, to undo everything that everybody's doing. Uh, I've seen people walk in and literally take over a hospital room, inappropriately so walk in and see that people are weeping and immediately begin to tell a joke to try to cheer everybody up. You know, this, we don't need to be somber here. We need to be uh, in, a, in a jovial mood. You know, laughter is the best medicine. And it is. There's, there's certainly good places for laughter. I use it a lot. But there's also times for tears and there's times for reflection. Or it may be that the doctors just walked out and said, uh, you know, do you have a will? And, and was serious, not like the thing I was doing a while ago. But you may want to talk about some last uh, minute decisions here that may have some implications. And so I need to know what's going on in the room, just like if I came into your house, I wouldn't take it over. I wouldn't immediately go to the thermostat in your house if I was a stranger and adjust it. Even as my friend, you better leave That's my right. thermostat alone. <laughs> I know my limits. And, uh, you know, there are people that feel very picky about that kind of thing. You know, I wouldn't uh, start going through your things and, and rearranging them for you and saying, you know, let's straighten this up here. And the same is true for anybody in crisis. If you look at a crisis as a vulnerable time and your thinking mechanism shuts down, just like, you know, if somebody would have walked in that room that I was telling you about when I was told the news about my son and began to, to make decisions for me or saying, well, what you need to do is this, I probably either wouldn't have heard them or been so angry that I would have asked them to leave because you don't want, to, you don't want somebody taking over. I've just had... Uh, my son taken away from me in one sense. I don't want somebody else coming in and taking something else away from me. You've got to put yourself in the shoes of what it's like uh, to be in that position, to be vulnerable, to walk in that person's shoes. And that means you've got to be quiet long enough to surmise, to listen, and to be astute, and maybe just to be quiet. And uh, that, that can mean a lot. Uh, a man named John Trevacas wrote patient prayers, talking to God from a hospital bed, and some of his are serious and some are not so serious. But he wrote uh, this one called Prayer for a Most Thoughtful Visitor. This is who impressed him. Bless her for not saying, you look terrific. I would have had to feel back. I feel pretty good, too. Bless her for not talking about her aches and pains. I sense they are probably more painful than mine. Bless her for her smile that lights up my room one of those genuine smiles that are so rare today. But most of all, God, bless this dear, thoughtful soul for sneaking me a corned beef on rye. <laughs> so sometimes you get down to the important things. You know, there are times when we can be creative and do some things that might be very uh, individual. And, and uh, people often ask me, what am I supposed to say when I go and make a hospital visit? What am I supposed to say? at a time of death when I go to a funeral and see the family? Uh, what am I supposed to say if somebody loses their job and I want to go over and be supportive? And uh, I say, I don't know what you're going to say. 
if I gave you a list, or if Dr. Hahn put up a list and said, this is what you say in, in, in that situation, uh, you would probably find it an inappropriate list for you. We're individuals. We're personalities that are made in a very unique way. And if you're going to come and visit me and just give me a list of canned things that Dr. Hahn has given you to say, or that uh, a chaplain from MD Anderson has given you to say, then you probably might as well just uh, phone it in or, or send a letter or something, because I really probably am not going to hear a whole lot. Can you think back of, of times when you've really been in a very serious crisis and somebody was there with you, and for the life of you, you can't remember what they said, but you can certainly remember they were there? Sometimes words are extremely important, and sometimes it's not the words, it's, it's how they're said, it's the intonation, and it's the fact that you, you're there with me, standing with me in the storm. Uh, not many people will do that. Not many people will ride it out with me without trying to do something to fix it. Um, one lady wrote it this way. Oh, this Robert's is, got a comment over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just want to say that... Um, that was kind of similar to what happened earlier this semester when my, my mother and I were driving. This woman had a car wreck in front of us, and she jumped over the guardrail. She was okay, but her car was totally damaged. And she got out of the car totally hysterical. And my mom knew to go up to her and just hold her, just put her arms around her. She didn't tell her anything because the girl was screaming, hollering, this is my boyfriend's car, he's going to kill me. Mom saw him and said, don't worry about that, just be glad that you're alive. Yeah. And kind of find out, she called my mom later that day, and she said, I'm so glad you were there because she said, um, she said something as if when you hugged me, it felt as if it was my mother mm. there with me that day. Yeah. So it was something about the proxemics and touch. Yeah. And, it, and my mom was telling her stuff, but I know she wasn't listening. So I think the touch and proxemics had a lot to yeah. do with it. And that somebody could respond immediately, was brave enough to do that. Because it's not easy to go. It's... You're awkward sometimes hugging your friends, and to go hug a total stranger. Yeah. That's my mom's. That's just her personality. Yeah. I mean, she, if she sees somebody that's hurting, she'll go over there and touch them or something. You know. But we need people like that, and and you know, thank goodness that there are folks that are willing to run that risk. Um, and we all have that capability to respond. It may not be uh, with a hug. It may just be just being there. It it really doesn't have to be uh, all out. The thing that I try to remember when I'm in that situation, if I'm trying to be the helper, if I'm on the giving end of that, is hysteria may be okay. Uh, I've never known of anybody in the, that has stayed in a hysterical state for years, you know. I so, considered it the well, day they knocked the front off my Lincoln. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it's okay for a the while. The paramedics were a little concerned. Yeah. But, yeah, you're right. I got over it. Yeah. I mean, you're here and you're... you're Functioning very well tonight, Dr. Hansen. We're Thank very you. proud of you. It took about an hour. <laughs> uh, to be, you know, one of the things they taught us uh, when we were, when I was in training for chaplaincy, is that when you when you walk into a situation, and many times it's very difficult because you don't know the family, you don't know what's, I mean, you don't have a prior relationship. But if if a death has occurred and you're walking in there to be uh, supportive, if they choose to have a minister there, uh, my uh, supervisor said, just remember these words when somebody is hysterical or they're beating their heads on the wall, or they're threatening to, to walk uh, away from the hospital and never come back, this too will pass. You know that that storm does come through, and sometimes it's a great big violent relief, uh, release, uh, but very seldom is that pathological, very seldom is it harmful. Uh, I remember one time I worked to death at another hospital here in Houston. I was called over uh, because the, uh, another family had known me. This happened to be the death of a 12-year-old, uh, and he had died unexpectedly after some heart surgery. And uh, uh, when the doctor told them that the child had died, uh, the mother just stood straight up, and she just looked almost comatose, except she was standing, not toast, comatose. She, she just stood straight up, and the doctor just kept talking about what had happened to the child and, and how sorry they were and these medical things happened. She didn't hear a word. and. Uh, basically ignored her reaction. Then the dad asked the doctor a question, the doctor left, and the mother was still standing up and everybody kind of rushed to her, and the dad walked out and he said, I need, I need to go get some air. Well, when he did that, uh, everybody in that room panicked because I don't know what they thought the dad was gonna go do, jump off the building or just what, uh, but he just 
wanted to go get some air. The mother had dealt with it in her way by, by going into shock. He was dealing with it by going out to, to the staircase and just breathing and doing whatever else. But to hear the conversation of all the family and some of the other people that were in there, somebody go and be with him. You better watch him. We don't know what's going to happen to him. Uh, he was back in the room 10, 15 minutes. Somebody did go to be with him very quietly. But there's nothing that you could have done that, you know, that I don't think, uh, in a normal you can't situation. can't fix it. You can't uh, undo what the doctor had said. And uh, who's to say how any of us would react in that situation? but please give me the space to react the way that I need to until I can kind of get my bearings back together. I think we're made in a way, uh, and this gets somewhat into my theology bias, but I think we're made in a way where we can only take shocking news in little increments, that a part of us shuts down when it's just terribly devastating news. And, uh, and that may be very helpful. In fact, I think we need it. Sometimes denial is extremely helpful. Uh, you just talked earlier about, I expect the person to come back. Oh, yeah, he'll be back. The, you know, it's, he's just asleep. Uh, did you notice on Selena's uh, viewing of the casket yesterday, some people could not accept the fact that she was dead until the dad actually opened the casket and they could see the body. You know, that there was, there was that need that was there. Uh, but until they actually saw it, they didn't want to believe that she was really dead. It was too devastating to accept that. That's not abnormal. That's not uh, sick. It's just saying... I'm not built to handle a permanent separation very easily. I've got to, to deal with that. Judith Madison has written a book called Life is Good, Life is Hard, and, and she wrote a little poem called Our Presence that I like to use as perhaps an example of what we all have to offer. We stumble on those who hurt so deeply that they cannot trust and dare not believe for fear of betrayal or loss. We problem solve or listen or pray the pain will go away. Day after day, we wait to see what may never be, wholeness. Yet, we must wait and stand beside, for it is the steady hand, the repeated kindness, the patient ear, which may bring hope. Those who suffer do not need our answers. They need our constancy, even when we're tired or rejected or confused. We who believe in an everlasting presence give the best help by saying, whatever happens, I'll be there. That's the kind of person I want with me. And I, that's the model that I would hope all of us would perhaps shoot for. And uh, Sometimes we'll do better at that than others. And, uh, and yet that's really, I think it's incredible the amount of power, the amount of healing, the amount of strength that comes from about someone who's willing to stop and to at least be with me and not talk me out of the pain that I'm going through. Comments? relate to any of this or you're not there yet <laughs> some of you are and some of you are well, let me give you a few statements that sometimes I have heard from patients or family uh, and, it, and just kind of put yourself in the position if you were trying to be a supportive person to this person first of all what are they really saying and second of all what could you offer or what kind of response uh, could you give some uh, might be better than others um, for example, I heard a husband say one time whose wife was just coming out of surgery and I was asking how much longer they were going to keep her and all that stuff and she was responding some but she was still pretty out of it because of anesthesiology. Um, he said, she's got to get out of here so she can get the house in order and fix my supper. Not. <laughs> now, he was making an attempt at humor. Okay? But I also heard a lot of truth in what he was saying. Uh, what do you think? I think I want to hurt that boy. <laughs> <laughs> he may, now their relationship was such that he probably could say that and get away with it. They'd been married 45, 50 years. And so he didn't say anything that she probably was surprised at. And maybe that was his way of saying what I also heard in spite of the little hook that was there, my expectation is for you to get well, is I have full expectations that you're going to get through this and we're going to get back to normal. So I have to give him the benefit of a doubt in that one because I also wanted to 
to stop him and say, wait a minute, you're talking about fixing supper here, and she's got tubes and sutures and all kinds of things. Uh, but that was what their relationship was. No, yes. maybe he was also related to the fact that he needed her in a funny, quirky kind of way. I think so, that he was saying, I do need you. Uh, He's tired of opening cans. Yeah. And actually, he went on and explained. He, he had done everything in the house. The house was totally ready for her to come home. It was spotless. Every dish had been done. Every a piece of dirty laundry had been done. And uh, that, when, he, when he finished his statement, it, it began to make more sense. He really was trying to say, I do need you, and I have done some things. And he was also saying, I don't like what you've had to do all these years, and I'm ready for somebody else to come do it again. So it, maybe it was a, 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 in a roundabout way, maybe a typical man way, of saying, uh, uh, you know, this, this is uh, what I want from you. Uh, this is what I need from you. Okay, you ever been told before you go and visit somebody, he or she doesn't know their condition yet, so don't mention it. Or they don't know the outcome of the surgery yet, so don't mention it. They don't know uh, that it's cancer. How do you respond if that's told you before you go in? Yes. Uh, it kind of happened with my sister, and uh, my response was pure panic. I was scared to death she was going to see it in my eyes, or or see it, or I'd slip, or she'd ask me, yeah. or she'd say, be truthful, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. It does. It puts a, a pretty heavy burden on you, doesn't it? And, it? and you are afraid it's going to show in your face or whatever. Did you have to keep the secret very long? or? Well, she slipped into a coma, and... Uh, then uh, she had a cerebral hemorrhage, and then you know things sort of escalated. And in about 24, I mean, we slept in in the area. You know, it was a Methodist mm -hmm. hospital. And then it was very strange because I never knew this would happen to me. But the uh, Oriental doctor came out and he said, "So sorry, waited 24 hours, had to pull plug. She didn't survive. She did." Oh my! I was in major shock. Um, I was screaming inside, but I wasn't screaming outside. I was one of those standing stiff. I, I think I want to kill him. You know, I, just, I was I was praised. Yeah. And you know, when that kind of thing happens, it's almost like you're detached from the event. Like this can't be real. That's something else. That's somebody else. That's not me or my sister. Um, sometimes when people will put expectations, do not tell somebody what's going on. I wonder, is this coming from the family? Or are they trying to protect the patient because they really know them too well, but they can't accept it? So it's very difficult. And you know, the scenario you just described is even more so because you didn't get to, it sounds like you didn't get to say your goodbyes, which may not have been an option anyway, but still, that's always. One other instance, uh, my father-in-law had, uh, we discovered he had lung cancer. And we were told not to tell him because he, he truly had always said, I don't want to know. So yeah. we had to handle the entire thing and constantly let him believe he was progressing. And, and just about like a month before, when he really got terminal, then he realized. But we were, we were forced to keep it a secret. In order to honor what he had asked for. No, That's probably. a little different, uh, but it's, it's still a burden. I mean, it's tough. Isn't sometimes the, the, the patient sometimes knows, I think, even though you, you go in there and you, you want to talk about everything else but the medical, yeah. what's going on, but yet even though you're talking about something that maybe was previous in the relationship or something or something you did with the person before, yeah. it's like they know that that's like the, the message that's not real, the really message. The real yeah. message is, hey, I know you're not going to be here very long, and they understand that somehow, and you under, you know that they understand it somehow, and they go along and play this game with you. Yeah, you get in a big game. Yeah. When my dad was dying, my mother didn't, he, he had emphysema, and then he t had a bad fall and hit his head. My mother didn't want me to come the 300 miles to visit because she was afraid he would think he was dying if I came to visit, if I took off work. And the doctor said, let her come anyway. And so I did, but then we had to play this game that this is a social visit, and yet Dad and I both knew this was probably the last visit, 
only you couldn't talk about it because mother was denying. Mm -hmm. you know, it got very complicated, and I, I remember feeling both sad and relieved when it was over with and time to fly back home. Confusing. Karen? I think that's sort of related to um, what happened when my husband passed away because that was only a little over a year since my father had passed away. And, and my mother, I think, intending, well, my mother was never crazy about flying and, and, and just didn't enjoy doing it, uh, but, you know, saw it as, as sort of a nasty necessity. And, <laughs> and um, you know, and I, we were in Houston, and my mother was in Albuquerque. The funeral was going to be in Utah. So we discovered there was a flight that, you know, would leave Houston, touch down in Albuquerque, pick up passengers, and then would go to Salt Lake. Perfect. So my mother's getting it out on the plane, and, you know, I will have already been on the plane in Houston. She'll be getting on in Albuquerque. And I discovered that was a really strange experience because I didn't, and in fact, I, um, I didn't really realize till my mother's funeral when I really did a lot of grieving, and I realized I can finally do this now because I was busy at my husband's funeral, busy being very strong. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my cousin later wrote me kind of concerned things. She was sort of thinking I was doing this because of, you know, my husband, the Marine, would sort of want me to be this. And I think there was some of that. But some of it was also because I was playing this game of, you know, trying to, trying to uh, protect my mother. Because, you know, I, I mean, I really felt like my mother was kind of, you know, was sort of reliving her loss through me and, and kind of grieving double time or whatever. And so we were sort of uh, playing this little game, stepping around of it's not that bad, you know. And, and uh, yeah, it is kind of silly that you find yourself slipping into those. Yeah, and each family has their own set of parameters set up. And, you know, you just, you just have to do that. As an outsider, as a minister, sometimes I can deal with those or be a little more open or challenge that gently. Uh, but basically, if that's the system that's in place, that's what's working for you as a family. It's not necessarily my place to come in and, and unravel that. Uh, whatever helps you to get through the, the crisis of the moment may be very appropriate. Uh, with the understanding that at some point I may want to plant a seed and say, you know, if you ever want to just talk, I'm available. Or perhaps it's a month or two months or six months after the funeral when some of this begins to get processed a little better. And uh, those are the times when many times those of us in the caregiving end drop the ball. It's, it's six months or a year anniversary of a death or a holiday without a spouse or a parent uh, or a child. When those are the times when we could really open up a conversation or just to get a card and say, I'm, I'm thinking about him also. To know that you're not the only one makes a difference. Uh, so, um, again, if it's a hospital patient you're visiting, and it's like you described, if there are some rules set up, or you feel like we can only talk about safe things, but the uh, the unexpressed is not is uh, needs to be said. Sometimes you got to be creative and find ways, or even take the risk. If it's just you and that person, and you've got a relationship, I've got some things I really would like to say to you, but I don't know if it's okay to do it. As Joan Rivers says, can we talk? And let them say yes or no. Uh, but maybe, maybe that's a gift that they're looking for. Yes? Allison. Um, I was just going to share. <clears throat> Recently, I've had a lot of death in my life. But one of the hardest things to deal with is, and I'm going to start crying, but it's when you have it's... someone that's dying and they keep getting worse, and getting better and getting worse and getting better and you don't know what to say you know like I had a very close friend die of AIDS and he was constantly getting better and getting worse and then he was getting better to where you really started to believe that he was gonna be better and he was gonna live and then there would come times when you have to say hey I know that you're really gonna leave me soon and I really love you and I'm gonna miss you and all these things. But then it gets, just keeps going on and on and on. And you play these games with people, like my friend Rick, his, his lover. You know, Rick was so busy taking care of him 24 hours a day that he couldn't even live his own life. I mean, he was up all the time. He couldn't, he couldn't stand to have people over because he was afraid that they were gonna say bad things about the way he looked or the way he, you know, 
all, he had so many different things wrong with him, and it was just so difficult to keep, you know, keep this up because finally I found myself wishing that he would just die because it was so much easier to deal with it when he was finally gone and I could finally get it off, you know. But there's just so much, so many games and so much guilt that you really have involved and you really don't know what to say and what to do because with Rick, after, after Juan finally died, I was sitting there saying, well, you know, now it's time to move on. And that was in October and now he's still, he's moved back home to Kentucky but he still hasn't moved on, you know. He, he still carries the ashes around with him, and he still cries and everything, and so it's really difficult. It is. And you make a very good point when you talk about getting better and then getting worse. It, it's almost like a, an emotional roller coaster ride. It does make a difference, perhaps, in what subjects you can broach or what you can talk about. If they're really feeling bad, you may take more of a risk and, and get a little more open or intimate and say, this, this is really what I want to say to you. And when, think, when the person's feeling good, it's not my place to say, wait a minute, we know this isn't going to last because I don't know that. Uh, I don't know the timetable of anybody. Uh, I used to think I did, but I've stopped second guessing that kind of stuff as much as I can. And you're also right in that sometimes people reach a point and if it's somebody you love a lot, you almost don't know what to pray for sometimes. Do I go ahead and, and ask them to be rid of their suffering and to move on? Uh, or do I selfishly want to keep them here with me? And, but boy, that's a very real struggle that uh, anybody that's close to that person goes through. Uh, very, very tough. What I've always noticed is if you have a, a, a friend or a family member and they're terminally ill, I have noticed uh, when I did volunteer work too, um, <clears throat> people are afraid to hug them. It's almost like, is it catchy or something? Like and it's leprosy and exactly. cancer. Exactly. And I find that one of the ways to express some of these emotions may not necessarily be verbally, but those hugs and the listening uh, and let them bring it. And the more you just hang around with them and listen, yeah. the more they'll, they'll feel comfortable to tell you. That's a very good point. Uh, body language, uh, just t reaching down and touching a hand. Uh, you don't always have to have the words or the right words. You're right. Again, gets back to being there, constancy, uh, dependability. If you say you're going to come back tomorrow, you better mean it. Don't make a promise you can't keep. Because if, if I'm extremely lonely and you tell me you're coming back to see me tomorrow and you don't get to because of whatever, uh, that can be uh, devastating too. But, uh, but it doesn't take a whole lot. We think that it's big, grandiose things that make a difference when you're with somebody that's hurting. It's, it's really not. It's, it's the little thing. It's resolving to be with them. And the hugs are extremely important, too. It, it's often the lack of touch. Uh, you know, often the, the most welcome nurses and doctors are those that will come in and, and, and be touching them as well as giving them medical advice and caring for them in many ways. So that it's a very, we don't lose that just because we're sick. We don't stop being needy human beings. It's just that we're sick. So. It's interesting. And then my grandmother has Alzheimer's, and I talked to her when she was coherent and said goodbye and gave her permission to die, but she keeps living because she's one of those <clears throat> people that you wish wouldn't. But um, my son wanted to see her and when How we old is she? she? She'll be 94 this summer. And when we were home uh, over spring break, my son wanted to see her really badly, and so I knew that it was probably not the best choice, but I took him and we went to see her. She's in a nursing home and she's extremely violent, vindictive, and vicious. Um, and so when I bent down and touched her, she yelled at me to get my hands off of her and not ever touch her again, which really bothered mm. my eight-year-old. And then, um, I, so I just, so I said, okay, and I backed off and I just looked at her and she looked up at me and she said, just get away from me. So Alex has these terrible last memories of his grandmother. She's still alive, but he probably won't see her again. And he's very angry because she didn't recognize him and she always and recognized eight. him. He's eight, right? She always recognized him. So he has all this anger. There's a hard choice as a parent because I remember when my grandfather was dying, I made the nurses let me take the kids into ICU so they could see him because he was still coherent. And I didn't care what they said. They were going to see their great-grandfather. But this is his great-grandmother. She's dying. He's angry and she doesn't know him. So it's 
-hmm. It's hard to know what to do with your kids. Yep. Yeah. And she's at a point she's very <laughs> unpredictable. Because you might go in the next day and she'd say, yes, hug me. Because you used to hug her. Right. Yeah. Um, I would tend to say we often err on the side of overprotecting our kids from that than allowing them to experience it. We think if we don't let them experience the pain of that, even if it's something negative that comes out of it, that we're doing them a favor. I'm not so sure that's always true. That as painful as it was for you and, and your son to experience that, at least they, he has some contact rather than it just being so detached. Um, death is not pretty and dying is not always pretty. It's very painful. But it is also a part of life, and if we can adjust along the way, perhaps it's, um, you know, because of hospitalization and nursing homes and other things, we often, children are not on the front line with that. If people are, if the person is not in the house with you, uh, or if you don't go and visit them at home, that has changed. So it's, it's difficult if the only time you see that person is, is once their body is in the casket, if you choose to do that. What I always found was really difficult is my grandfather, he's, he's 65 and his health is starting to de deteriorate. He's always been a very, very strong man, construction worker, been working since he was 10. And when my great-grandmother died, his mother died and she, she had cancer and it was real hard for, for him to deal with putting her in a nursing home. It was a really, really hard thing for him to do. Uh, now he's he's had surgery on his eyes because he's not able to see anymore. I don't know what kind of cancer he has, but it's in his eyes. He doesn't want anyone to see him. He refuses for any of us to go and be with him because he just doesn't want anyone to see him. Even though it's not, he hasn't died yet, or they haven't said that that's going to happen or anything. He just doesn't want us anywhere Can you near call him. him? He, he won't even talk to us on the phone, you know, he, he just prefers we just leave him alone and that's real, real hard for all of us to deal with sure. because I'm supposed to be getting married in a year and a half and I want him to give me away and I don't know how to, to yeah. broach that with him because I know it's going to hurt him because he may not be able to see when he walks down the aisle, so I know that that's going to be real hard for him. Yeah, that's setting up a barrier too that's very difficult to deal with. And I don't have the answers for that. Uh, I do think at some point, many people find it's worth it to go ahead and run some risk, to keep trying. At least you can say, I've done something. Uh, and if he's, it, it's still his right to say no. Uh, but to, to know that at least you've tried. And maybe he hears that as a way that, that I still care, even if I can't see you. So. Okay, well, this is a good place to pause. We'll continue this discussion after our break. <laughs> 